equity company. He has been involved in a number of initiatives, come for example, in the development of global corporate social responsibility initiatives such as IS 2600 and also global um, reporting initiative over the years. He has chaired Global Compact France and French Standardization Committee on Corporate Social Responsibility. He teaches Corporate Social Responsibility at Rennes School of Medicine or Business and also Sorbonne, Sorbonne Paris Nord University over the years. So it's, our, it's my pleasure to introduce him today. And also he'll be talking about this theme in relation to corporate social responsibility and business contribution to the UN sustainable development goals, especially regarding well-being at work and beyond. In particular, his presentation aims to address the new psychosocial risks that have occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic and the daunting challenges that the managers have to pay face to maintain workers' well-being. So he's going to share his insights and also possible solutions to some of these problems. Over to you, Peer. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Shrikant. You can see my, my uh, presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, first, I would like to, to thank very much uh, uh, Dr. Russell de Souza and Shrikant uh, Nimagada for the kind invitation to make this presentation. And uh, uh, for me, it's also uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, remind what uh, corporate social responsibility is and also the contribution of business to the UN Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals uh, in relationship with uh, our theme, which is uh, well-being uh, of workers in uh, companies. And uh, first, uh, I come back on the definition of social responsibility through the, uh, the international standard ISO 26000. Uh, they define the social responsibility as the responsibility of an organization, of a company, for its Im the impacts of its decision and activities on society and, and, and the environment. It's as well uh, negative impacts, but also positive impacts. So uh, it's also the, in the definition, it's also said that uh, social responsibility contributes to sustainable development, uh, including health and the welfare of society. So uh, that's an important point for us because uh, social responsibility is also a way to achieve the well-being of the, the workers. And through the core subject of social responsibility, uh, we have one core subject called labor practices. And in that core subject, we deal with uh, health and safety of workers. Uh, I would also, uh, th this uh, ISO 26000 was uh, launched in 2010, and in 2015, the United Nations launched the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a set of uh, goals for the next 15 years till uh, 2030. And it's really uh, a nice uh, program for all the, the whole world. Uh, not only for the states, but also for the companies. And uh, it's a set of uh, 17 goals. And uh, some of the goals uh, pertain to uh, health. And uh, of course, there is one goal, the goal number three, which is a good health and well being. And the, the, the aim of this goal is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And of course, uh, work, uh, well-being at work is one aspect of these goals. But many of the, other, the 16 other goals are linked with health issues. For instance, uh, the SDG uh, 8, which is uh, decent work and economic growth. Uh, the aim 
of this goal is also to promoting health as a driver of inclusive economic uh, growth. Uh, in the SDG three, good health and well-being pertaining to the workplace, there are a, a set of uh, targets, and some of them are directly uh, related to well-being. For instance, the target 3.4, uh, saying that we should promote mental health and well-being, not only in the workplace, but uh, also in uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, also, one very important point, even in uh, on the workplace, is to strengthen the prevention and treatment of substance abuse, including narcotic drug abuse and harmful use of alcohol, and uh, access to quality essential health care services, and uh, uh, quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccine for all. I, I think that it's <laughs> Uh, really uh, up to date for us. And uh, in the SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, growth uh, the idea is to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men. And uh, the idea is also to promote safe and secure and working environment for all workers. So we are directly in our subject. Uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, uh, will uh, not help to uh, fulfill these uh, sustainable development goals. And we can say, we, we can see already that uh, many of these goals are uh, directly impacted by the, the COVID pandemic. And, uh, and, and it will be uh, difficult to achieve the, these goals because of the, the COVID. So now uh, we come to our subject, which is uh, the challenges uh, of well-being uh, in times of COVID. And uh, the, the, the point is also how to manage the workforce and taking care of workers' well-being during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. We all know that uh, well-being is really uh, a condition of uh, the workers' uh, productivity and uh, health. And it's even in normal times, it's quite difficult, especially for the managers. But uh, uh, I said that it, it, was, it is really a daunting task now. Uh, and I, I try to uh, identify the, the new uh, psychosocial risk that have occurred during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, work arrangement and condition are changing considerably, bringing uh, new psychological challenges for the health and the well-being of workers. And uh, the psychosocial risk emerged during the period and the rapid spread of the virus and strict isolation measures and still persist or increase over time as business uh, open uh, their doors. So uh, I, I listed uh, some areas for action. Uh, some are related to environment and equipment. Uh, others are on the workload, work pace and work schedule, uh, violence and harassment, work-life balance, job security, management leadership, uh, communication, information, and training, health promotion and prevention of negative coping behaviors, social support, psychological supports. So it's not really new for you because uh, this morning uh, some of these uh, subjects have been uh, dealt with. And uh, my perspective is not a medical perspective, it's a, a business related perspective. Uh, and uh, I will speak as a, a business person having to face this kind of, uh, of issues. And uh, the question of equipment and environment, of course, uh, is very important during the COVID-19 
COVID-19 crisis, workers may face higher anxiety and stress due to the physical working environment. And uh, especially uh, in the beginning, uh, the shortage of personal protective equipment, such as masks, for instance, uh, increased the, the level of anxiety, of stress of the, of the workers. But now we have masks and, the, and we can say that the prolonged use of heavy uh, uh, mask uh, is leading to fatigue, exhaustion, claustrophobia, isolation, for instance. So uh, in, in fact, we, we, we are crossing very odd times. Uh, also, anxiety and stress were due to the lack of clarity uh, uh, about uh, the, the practices to limit the risk of exposure to the coronavirus because it was a, a illness that uh, we didn't know before. And uh, of course, the lack of uh, appropriate equipment uh, and inadequate physical environment uh, had to this stress, uh, for instance, for the, the employees working from home and that were not really uh, prepared to, for, for this and were not equipped for this. Uh, this diagram, I find this diagram, it's uh, from US, but I think it's, it's for all the country. It's a diagram showing uh, the occupational risk related to the, uh, the, the profession we, we, which are the, the most uh, at risk for COVID-19. So on the right of the, the diagram, you see the, the, the green profession, it's a healthcare profession. So they have been really exposed to the virus but uh, other profession also, the f what we call the frontliners, uh, have been also uh, exposed to, to the virus. Um, the, the second is about the, the, the workload, the, the workload and the, the work pace. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, workers may experience both overwork or underwork causing uh, higher stress and negative effect on health and on job satisfaction. And uh, it, it's, it, it's true that uh, uh, work under pressure, longer hours and consecutive shifts uh, increased workloads. And uh, worker in the production of efficiency goods uh, have <laughs> To, to endure uh, overtime hours and heavy workload. And uh, some other group, uh, including uh, those working from home, uh, have uh, either overload or underload. Uh, another uh, new risk and, uh, well, uh, increased risk was the, the, the violence and harassment. Uh, it, it's, it has been proven that the risk of violence and harassment, both physical and psychological, uh, is likely to increase during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, in particular against healthcare workers, uh, but also uh, against staff assigned to ensure measures and laws. Uh, against uh, workers in the sale and transport of essential goods, uh, cyberbullying. It's, it, it has been uh, shown that uh, due to a uh, large number of people working from home and using ICT, uh, cyberbullying has increased. And the last but not least, uh, domestic violence. Uh, has really increased in France. It's about uh, twenty percent more domestic violence uh, due to uh, spending more time in close contact with uh, violent uh, family members uh, because of the confinement measures. Uh, the question of work-life balance uh, also. Uh, may contribute to the deterioration of workers' uh, work-life balance with negative uh, 
uh, effects on their mental health and well-being and their productivities. And it's because, uh, for instance, the limitation of social life due to restriction aim at uh, limiting the contagion, and especially uh, colleagues couldn't meet each other, uh, blurring boundaries between personal lives at, and work, uh, particularly when working at, uh, from home. Uh, remote work seems uh, a nice thing, but uh, uh, now it, it's also proven that uh, too much uh, remote work is also uh, something that could uh, be uh, of ne negative impacts on the, on the workers. And uh, of course, uh, when you are working from home, you have additional uh, uh, household chores and caregiving duties, such as childcare, homeschooling, and take care of our older relative and family members. Uh, especially uh, in France for the first confinement where the, the schools were, where there was a shutdown of the, the schools. Uh, of course, the, 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 there is a consequence of the, the mental health of the workforce uh, on their friends and family, on the community and on the society at large. Uh, of course, due to the COVID crisis, uh, many uh, enterprises have closed or uh, have uh, restructured their activities and with a dramatic impact on uh, employment. And uh, many enterprises had to, to change their work practices and procedures to adapt to the, the new requirements. Uh, in many cases, it went well, but for uh, small companies, for instance, uh, it was a, a nightmare. Uh, also, also, many workers are worried to lose their jobs and incomes. Uh, so it, it increased uh, stress, anxiety, depression, and, and burnout. Uh, and especially, there were some uh, group of workers that have, are particularly at risk. For instance, workers with disabilities, uh, young workers, uh, workers in informal economy, casual workers. Uh, I would add uh, students. Uh, many of my students didn't find uh, easily uh, inter inter internship, for instance. And even those who had internships couldn't meet their colleague. And it's not a very productive internship to be at home and just uh, communicating by, by internet with uh, the, the colleagues uh, without seeing them. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really uh, a task in, th that uh, for, the, for the managers and uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, employers and managers are facing difficult challenges uh, on multiple fronts as workers themselves and the families, for the customers, the suppliers, the business partners, uh, governmental and financial systems. And uh, they have to take care of the, the spread of the contagions, the rules and regulations, market challenges, uh, the, 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 the change to the labor law, for instance, uh, OSH requirements, etc. So uh, the, the, the employers and the managers find themselves under strong pressure, which generates stress. And I, I just saw yesterday a study in France showing that uh, nearly half of the, of the workers uh, had uh, an increased trust during the pandemic and uh, the managers, even the, the managers are twice more at risk as the other workers. Uh, at the same time, there was a critical role to play in protecting their employees from the stress and psychological pressure generated by the, the pandemic. So uh, also uh, in the context, the question of communication, information, and training has been also something important. 
the extensive media coverage of the, the epidemic is, uh, is of course essential to encourage uh, precautionary and preventive measures, but it can also uh, influence the psychological response to the infectious disease threat and uh, amplifying apprehension, worries, and anxiety. So uh, the increasing amount of fake news and misinformation surrounding the COVID-19 crisis is detrimental to people's mental health and well-being. Well -being. I think we, we all experiment in this. And uh, of course, fake news cre can increase stereotype, prejudice, and discrimination. For instance, in, in France, uh, Asian uh, French were uh, discriminated by others saying that they, they, they all were Chinese and were responsible for the virus, which, is, which was completely crazy. Uh, it can also lead to confusion over what information is true or false. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, may endanger their, their health. Uh, of course, uh, due to uh, uh, lockdown and physical distancing, school closures, quarantines, working from home brought uh, profound changes to normal routines, uh, increasing the risk of uh, this unhealthy behaviors that may affect both physical and mental health and have ne negative impacts on job performance. And uh, what we call unhealthy behaviors include uh, heavy alcohol consumption, uh, cigarette smoking, poor eating habits, uh, less frequent physical exercise, and uh, irregular sleep patterns. I think we uh, experimented uh, uh, some of these uh, things. Uh, so the, the, the need for uh, social support uh, is, uh, was, is really important in, in such circumstances, especially uh, uh, because, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, workers have to isolate themselves, some uh, uh, workers that return to the workplace have uh, adopted measures to prevent uh, con contagion, so that also affects uh, social interactions. And uh, also the, the employees working from home uh, who were previously accustomed to office life may find the shift quite difficult, uh, causing a deterioration of their mental health. So, uh, so the, the psychological support is really uh, key and uh, in workplace, uh, some, uh, some companies have uh, put in place uh, psychological support, they have provided psychological support uh, because uh, many workers have uh, increased uh, stress. Uh, this was a, a survey from the UK uh, saying what uh, have been helpful for, for you, uh, for your well-being at work during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the, the response showing that uh, supporting flexible and remote working has been very important. Uh, regular contact and uh, staying connected also, and uh, good team working and team support is also uh, also important. Fin finally, more than the, the safety measures. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to uh, maybe uh, give some advice, but uh, uh, it's linked to what has been said this morning uh, for the managers. Uh, I would recommend to the managers to lead uh, with empathy, because uh, this is a hard time for everyone. Uh, stay connected, uh, especially with uh, their employees. Uh, try to be authentic. Uh, share their experience managing through this time and discuss common challenges about being uh, sheltered in place. 
uh, ask how your, your, your teams are doing on a personal level, which is uh, not the usual uh, behavior for the managers, but in this case, I think it's, uh, it's very important uh, because uh, uh, personal life and uh, work life are, are mixed at this time. Uh, be alert uh, in cases some employees are feeling isolated. It's important to uh, identify the, the employees that uh, are uh, meeting some problems uh, and still set expectation and establish work goals based on output. Uh, that doesn't mean they micromanage their employees, but at least they, they try to organize the, the work. And uh, finally, make sure that people feel uh, in the loop, uh, that no, no one is, uh, is left alone. So uh, thank you. I think it's the end of my talk and I will be happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Pierre, for that very stimulating talk and sharing your thoughts, insight, and experience in relation to corporate social responsibility, a very useful uh, topic for anyone working in any organization. So please uh, stay with us for the discussion. And I move on to the next speaker, um, Dr. Avinash Disausa, who will be talking to us today on working from home in the COVID-19 crisis, challenges and solutions. Avinash is a good friend of mine and a very busy practitioner in Mumbai. He's working as a consultant psychiatrist and he's also a psychotherapist. And uh, he works with eight mainstream and special schools in Mumbai as a visiting school psychiatrist, a counselor and a school mental health expert. He has been with me and Professor De Souza since the inception of IAUPM for the last six years. And we worked on many themes in terms of further enhancing uh, various work we have done with IAUPM. He's one of the few psychiatrists who in, in addition to psychiatry qualification has masters in counseling and psychotherapy. And he's also has a qualification um, in human resource development. He has masters in business administration. But importantly, um, he's one of the few people I know who has a number of publications, nearly 700 publications in both national and international journals, and is author of 12 books in the area of mental health. So it's my privilege to invite him to talk on this topic, and he'll share his views and thoughts and insights on this very useful topic today. Over to you, Avinash. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to everyone in the UK and Europe and uh, good evening to everyone in India. And I think it's late night at Australia. But anyway, I think hello to the world. And uh, I am here today to discuss a very important topic. And the reason I first thought about whether I should make a presentation, should make a presentation. And then I thought that no, I want to go extempore on this because this is something which is very close to my heart and that is working from home. And uh, in India particularly, I can primarily describe the Indian scenario because I have seen work happened at home from India and how it affects all of us, how it affects people, how it affects families, how it affects the people who work. And there are some serious situations, some not so serious situations, some funny situations, multiple things that happen when a work from home scenario happens. Uh, well, at the outset, we all know about the pandemic. So there's nothing to mention on that front. But what's very important to mention is that the pandemic was unprecedented. I think in our era, no one has seen a pandemic. No one really in Mumbai, particularly, we've had the city closed for a day, or maybe two days. But we've never really had a lockdown. We've never really had the city closed for weeks and months. And we've never really had a situation where we've had an academic year where school hasn't happened and the children have had to study from home. We've never really had a year where people haven't gone to office and have had to work from home. Um, and I think uh, the key issues about working from home, and I think which concern us from a psychological medicine perspective is, can the home environment 
continue to produce an environment as conducive as the workplace. There were a number of surveys done to try and find out if people were more productive when they work from home. And 30% of companies in India felt that their employees were up to 50% more productive because they work from home. Now, that's a very interesting scenario. Normally, people wouldn't like to take work home. But the employee said that the advantage of working from home was one is it gave them a lot of flexibility of time. They said, I could work in the night, I could work in the afternoon, I could work whenever I wanted. I could also be around my children and my wife, so they never felt that I'm away from them. And uh, I was able to complete far more work, attend far more meetings, traveling was saved. In, in Mumbai, traveling is one of the biggest hassles. And people probably have to travel an hour on an average to reach their workplace. So they saved two hours of commuting, which got converted into work time. Uh, also, another thing that happened was that um, they did not have to waste time uh, coming back home from work, bathing, freshening up, talking to their spouses, talking to their children, because they were probably doing that anyway the whole day. So another one hour of work time got reduced and uh, got another work time got added. They could also work till late and sleep off. So they added an hour of work prior to sleeping. They added an hour of work early morning. So compared to office, employees mentioned that they began to add three or four hours of work extra, which probably never happened. And uh, well, um, everything became online. People became hyper um, communicative, as I would call it, online. And uh, one of the things that uh, you know uh, did happen was uh, everyone was online. So there was really no issue. So you have the employee working for his office online. Next to him, early morning, his son is sitting attending school online. Next to him, his spouse is attending her office online. And uh, the thing is that uh, if he has to talk to family and friends, he's also online. So he was practically online 24 hours. And the fact was being online, he got more work done because whenever a mail come, he would answer immediately. Whereas if he was in office, he would think, oh, I'll go and have that cup of coffee and probably come back and answer it later, which didn't happen. Whereas there was spontaneity in answering mails here. A lot of offices reported that mails began to be answered with a lag time of hardly five minutes. Whereas if they were in office, the lag time would be an hour, hour and a half before the employee answered a mail. So that was the other thing. And who wouldn't like to work in shorts? I love to work in shorts and I think everyone would like to work in shorts. So the thing is people were wearing all sorts of office clothes above. The upper half of the body was definitely different from the lower half of the body when they were working from home. So that added to comfort level. So there were people who wore a coat with short pants as though they were in Goa and they were working at home and you know attending meetings wearing uh, a tie but I, I remember a colleague of mine who told me, I love this. I'm wearing a coat. I'm wearing a tie. I'm attending a meeting, but I'm wearing a lungi. A lungi is a cloth you tie around yourself. Uh, you know, it's a South Indian attire. And he said, who wouldn't like to go to office like this? I'm enjoying myself. And he said, I can just get up, you know, eat, come back, uh, grab a cup of coffee when I want, go and play with my son for half an hour and come back. And the families were thrilled. Because these were people who would travel, these were people who would be busy, these were people who would be, you know, the whole time away. And they're now at home, they're available, they're at disposal. So this was something that, you know, families were sort of enthralled with this whole work from home. In fact, in Mumbai, you should know this, and I think everyone should know this. Offices have decided to allow work from home for another six to eight months in view of the fact that productivity has improved, you know. Financially, it had a huge impact. A lot of offices gave up their workplaces. They didn't have to pay rent because there were no employees coming. So they gave up their workplaces. They saved a huge amount of money when it came to rentals on a monthly basis. And because they saved a huge amount of money when it came, came to rentals, they were able to pay salaries of many of their workers. So the whole thing was that, you know, salaries of workers did not get cut as a result of this whole work from home situation, which was very important because this, this helped in um, a lot of employees, you know, receiving salary on a regular basis. Uh, another very important um, uh, factor was that very often, you know, what, what also now this, the, the, the flop side of working from home, um, the flop side of working from home was that, well, um, everyone could see what you're doing. Okay. 
So you couldn't chat with all those colleagues of the opposite gender as freely as you could probably chat with them when you were in office. You couldn't probably, you know, uh, move from your office, uh, I would say, page to seeing YouTube and seeing a movie and seeing things which, you know, people would normally do in office. And also what was there was that um, uh, what also probably happened as a result of this entire work from home thing was that the focus was only on the office screen. Now, obviously, when your spouse is standing behind you, the only thing you'll do is focus on the office screen, you know, nothing else. So obviously, so, you know, so a lot more work productivity also increased that way. So there was no chance to deviate from work. Because imagine, you know, every one hour, if your spouse comes and pops in, you know, what you're doing, what you're doing, these employees would be bound to be, you know, saying, oh, I'm busy working, there's an important meeting going on, they wouldn't want to probably deviate from that. Probably they had two Zoom meetings going on from two different IDs, one with their friends and one with the people at work. But then anyway, you know, this would happen. So on Microsoft Teams, the work would go on. So that would pop up when the spouse arrived and on zoom they would be with their school batch that would pop up and the wife went away so you know these kind of situations which were extremely hilarious also came up and yes uh, i think one of the effects of work from home was that a lot of fathers who were not interested in academics suddenly became aware of history geography biology chemistry because they were forced to simultaneously attend the online classes which their children attended at school so they became interested in their children's academics in fact a lot of people said that they began to spend a lot of time more concentrating and focusing on their children's academics more so than ever so that also began to happen uh, what also also another thing that of course came into the vogue because of this entire work from home situation was that families got together families communicated more they spoke more uh, families began to sort of uh, uh, and then also when you when families talk more speak more be with each other more there are bound to be a few skirmishes and a few fights so uh, there were couples who got at each other there were reports of increased domestic violence because of the couples fighting for space at home. One of the main constraints, the negative aspects of working from home in India is a space constraint. So let's say there are there are families who are bundled into maybe two rooms. That's the only occupancy, the, the space they have. Two rooms, six members on six gadgets working. So, you know, and one fellow has an important meeting. He wants everyone else muted. So there would be fights, you know, on on these counts. There would also be fights about the fact that uh, the school teacher is yelling and that the father is having an important meeting. And, you know, so all that kind of uh, rigmarole would also happen. So that was also one of the issues about this work from home thing. Well, uh, uh, there are people who have also spoken about the fact that the work from home thing was so good that uh, they could probably uh, remain, uh, as I said, they could even lie down and attend some meetings where they didn't have to show their face. So these were advantages of work from home. The disadvantages were no exercise, no commuting, no meeting colleagues. A lot of people missed the physical presence of the office. A lot of people missed the physical meeting of colleagues, the sharing of lunch boxes, the sharing of jokes, the sharing of coffee, the sharing of tea, the sharing of comments, which would probably happen. Yes, uh, a lot of people uh, missed traveling because they loved traveling. They had friends in other cities who they would love to meet, which they got cut off from. That also happened. Uh, but the work from home situation brought some families together, caused some families to go away from each other. It caused some families to probably uh, uh, be uh, fighting constantly. It caused some families to probably uh, be at loggerheads. It caused some families to bond. So there was a whole gamut of things that was happening in this work from home situation. One of the other important facets about the work from home situation was a, a lot of new short forms came into lingo. You know, so earlier, I mean, we had short forms uh, of different forms and we had WFH, work from home. That was a new short form that came, which people didn't know about earlier. So that was also something that came in. There was the entire uh, new, uh, people know, never knew about Zoom. People never knew about Microsoft Teams. People knew, never knew about WebEx. So the entire world got digitally connected. In fact, companies began to work faster with foreign colleagues because of the entire work from home situation. And there were companies that worked so well that they would have a project uh, ready in the in india 
send it to their colleagues in US who would work on it through the night. And the next morning, the project would be ready again in India. So, you know, this kind of recycling of work began to happen very fast. So that was one major advantage of this whole working from home situation. Well, some funny things also happened on the hilarious side. Well, there have been instances where colleagues have been attending a very busy meeting and their father or mother who's 70 or 80 years old comes with a pickle bottle and asks them to open it because it's not opening. These kind of things have happened in the middle of meetings. In the middle of meetings, you've had um, a pet dog suddenly come and jump about. In the middle of meetings, you've had a child come and suddenly ask you that he's feeling very hungry and he wants you to do something. And you've had to excuse yourself from a meeting and go. Well, these things are all part of the gamut of working from home. Well, there have been mothers who've been working from home with a baby in their arms uh, and uh, the baby playing, sitting on their lap while they've been attending meetings. So they've been doing their mothering jobs as well as sort of managing their work, which is exemplary. Uh, there have been a lot, a lot of digital literacy amongst older businessmen have also increased because of this work from home. A lot of them have had to go online. A lot of them have had to probably work online. A lot of them have had to go and mix and get used to the whole digital rigmarole online. So that's something which has also happened. Uh, I think one of the things which is most exemplary about work from home in the Indian scenario was how fast everyone has adapted to this digital turnaround. And everyone has adapted. I think human beings are very adaptable. And I think we've all adapted to this entire digital turnaround very well. We have been hyper communicative. There's no doubt on that front. We have been definitely, uh, I mean, become very text savvy, very internet meeting savvy. But it has also turned around mental health, tele-mental health. Who really thought telepsychotherapy, tele-mental health would take up such a boom? And it has become a huge boom today. It has resulted in telepsychiatric services being taken up by corporates in a very big way, which never ever happened in India. Telemental health has taken up in a very big way. People, India has become global. Doctors from all over the world are consulted. Doctors from patients from all over the world consult Indian doctors and vice versa. And I think what's happening is that even with regard to corporate mental health, earlier to fly down a corporate trainer for a program was very difficult. Today, you can do it online courtesy the COVID pandemic. To fly down people to go abroad and attend a course was very difficult. Today, the course is available online. So this is one advantage of this entire work from home situation that has happened. People have finished degrees. People have finished courses. People have got additional academic qualifications. A lot of things have happened. People have got used to digital banking, net banking. People who weren't net savvy have become net savvy. So that's one major advantage of this entire work from home scenario. Well, uh, on the flip side, uh, a lot of people have got glasses because they've probably you know, been overworking and a lot of screen time. There's been eye strain. There has been more and more injuries to thumbs and little fingers courtesy of holding the phone for a long period of time, numbness in the fingers, numbness in the hands, uh, sitting in one place with a lack of exercise has led to certainly increase in weight in certain people. Some people have been able to maintain their exercise. Uh, everything has happened online. So there's online yoga, there's online dance, there's online music, there's online dating. Uh, there's all sorts of things which are happening online. There are online marriages also that are happening. So uh, probably divorces will also happen online. And this is how, you know, things are probably progressing. And uh, interviews are happening online. People are being appointed online, fired online. This is how work from home happens. So a lot of these things, you know, do happen. And the key thing is that I think what we have to realize is that this is a new way of life. This was something we didn't know a year back. This is something we're getting used to now. It's something that is going to change the face of the world. The internet was powerful. We've only realized how much more powerful it is now, courtesy this. I mean, we wouldn't have been ever able, and I think Dr. Shrikant would agree, Professor Russell would agree, we would never be able to have a conference like this where we have delegates from all over the world probably fly into the UK. It would never happen. It's only possible today that, okay, we have delegates from probably so many countries attending to us because they're attending, sitting in the comfort of their houses. And that's one major advantage about working from home, that you know you can attend anything you want, wherever you want, in whichever part of the world you want. 
and when you want. And if you miss it, you have the recording. That's a major advantage. So, you know, even if you miss it, uh, you've not missed anything. You can always go back and have a look at it on YouTube. We can go back and look at it. You have the recording that's always available. So, so these are major advantage of this entire system. Whereas if in a real time conference, if you miss the lecture, you miss the lecture unless you get a video CD afterwards. But otherwise you miss the lecture. That doesn't happen here. There's always the chance for you to revisit and relearn and rethink and retake home, you know, all these things. The most important thing is we're changing. The world is changing. And I think IIOPM is doing an excellent job. We're, we're moving forward. I think the reason why we're different, it only brings me, uh, and I think I will end with two quotes, which I would want to quote here. And I think this is especially for Russell and Shrikant. And I think it's very important. The reason why we're successful is there were two roads in the forest. We took the road that was less traveled. And I think that's what made all the difference. That's the first quote. And the second quote is that this is just the beginning. The woods are lonely, dark and deep, but we have miles to go and promises to keep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash, for a wonderful presentation and also your uh, conclusion in terms of um, the way forward for IAUPM and, and, and the, the goals we have to achieve. But that, that is only possible with collaboration from so many delegates who are joining us today. And um, this conference is also a wonderful medium for us to communicate, exchange ideas, and to take the organizations forward, particularly IAUPM. So thank you for joining us and please stay with us for the discussion. And um, I'll move on to the next speaker, um, Debbie Hare, who will be talking to us on does psychological flexibility predict psychological well-being in staff working in an organization? I've known Debbie for nearly seven and a half years. Um, initially as a trainee forensic psychologist um, and later she became a chartered forensic psychologist and her research um, thesis for her master's uh, chartered, uh, chartered presentation or chartered, chartership is the current topic. And I, have, I had the privilege of uh, supervising her um, for this project. And uh, she is a genuine and wonderful and compassionate human being and um, staff and colleague, uh, patients, they like her and they like to work with her. And she has experience in various aspects of mental health and she works with both men and women in, in, in the current setting, managing patients with mental illness, personality disorder, learning disabilities. And uh, she has experience in various risk assessments and over the years has experience in providing staff training to assist in supporting the training and development needs within the organization. So she's going to talk to us on this topic over to you, Debbie. Thank you, Professor Shrikant. Just checking everybody can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Uh, yeah, so. Good. <laughs> um, thank you for that really lovely introduction. Um, and, and thank you to not only Professor Shrikant, but also um, to the senior leadership team at, at, at Cheswell Park Hospital um, at Doncaster, including you know Tony Gitty and, and my supervisor, Dr. Charlotte Caton, for being heavily involved in the research project and um, with whom it, it wouldn't be in existence. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just before I go into the presentation, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why I came to um, conduct this piece of research. Um, I think it really overlaps with a lot of the conversations and a lot of the topics which people have been talking about today. And also, I think the, the topics that people were talking about last week, and I was fortunate enough to um, be able to observe and attend the, the conference that happened a couple of years ago. So it's nice to see how the literature and, and what we've learned has, has changed over time. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, if you can share if you can see that. Um, okay. Sure. Uh, there we go. Um, so the reason I was um, looking at this area, which is essentially the topic of a concept called psychological flexibility and how it looks in terms of predicting psychological well-being in organisations, was that luckily we're in a really positive place in that we can 
know and understand a lot more about what impacts job related stress um, and burnout in the longer term. And we know that high stress, high demanding areas and, and jobs that require high emotional labour, um, as well as having less resources, not enough resources, unfortunately can contribute to that. Um, in the nature of the professions that we are in, um, we tend to focus on ill health. We tend to want to know what's contributing to these difficulties um, and what's at times leading to, to mental health disorders. There's less um, in the literature on what contributes towards positive mental health, so positive well-being overall. Um, and actually there's quite a big move in terms of positive psychology at the moment at looking at what contributes towards lives going well and um, what our strengths are and how some of those can protect us um, from developing some of these um, mental health difficulties in the longer term. This research was actually done before um, the COVID-19 pandemic, just before, um, but what I'll ask everyone to do is just to kind of think about how what, what areas kind of like relate into it and also at the end have a look about how some of the implications could be applied with um, what we've learned through, through the pandemic. Um, so just a bit of an introduction, um, as we've been talking about and um, we know that within the workplace um, generally high stressful environments and especially in healthcare settings and, and the nature of this research which was in a forensic healthcare setting and um, we know that jobs which require staff to use high emotional labour can actually lead to high levels of high emotional exhaustion as well. Um, I thought it was really interesting I think and um, what some of those speakers were saying earlier in that actually we're in at times a bit of a culture now where this high exhaustion and busyness and can lead to at times unfortunately a bit of a status symbol that things are more important when actually it can result as to being less effective and um, that's really important in the jobs that we do because our jobs are to look after and vulnerable patients or, or any patients so actually we need to be really effective in the jobs that we're doing and making sure that we're looking after ourselves. Looking at positive well-being, however, though, is, is all about um, lives going well. And it's it's tended in the literature to be broken down into these two areas of actually what builds um, positive emotions, positive feelings is one part of that, but also what helps us to function effectively. So in terms of when we're thinking about psychological well-being, they're the two kind of components that we're thinking about. Um, Kashtan um, actually argued that one of the key kind of like cornerstones that contribute to that and which unfortunately has been neglected in the literature at the moment is a concept called psychological flexibility and um, there has been literature which looks at what can contribute to positive well-being it's tended to focus more on demographics the environment um, and, and less towards cognitive processes or, or emotional experiencing and that's one of the things that I want to do in the research the purpose of this, we think of psychological flexibility as essentially being this, this process where um, someone can experience the present moment and the present moment might be difficult, it might be uncomfortable, it's not necessarily going to be something that's positive, but trying to experience that without avoiding, without judging um, and adapting behaviour when we need to, just keep in line with our goals. So if it's something that makes us feel less comfortable, looking at how we can adapt something to change that so that we're still being effective. Um, but essentially, it's the idea that we are adapting to a various amount of different situations and, and doing that when it's in keeping with our goals. So the evidence actually is saying that what we know so far about psychological flexibility is that it's positively associated with well-being and actually inversely associated with um, a wide range of distress. So it's more likely that if somebody's got less flexibility, that we're actually um, going to be more in distress and um, we're more likely to be kind of open to um, anxiety, general psychological distress, whereas if we have that high level of flexibility there's, there's a more level of well-being according to the literature. One of the things that I want to do is go on to is thinking about does that same level still apply in, in jobs which high emotional kind of like demand is quite present so in in the context of this research it was a forensic environment where understandably and um, the staff that are the supporting in day to day are managing a various range of different presentations, complex patient groups, and also day-to-day -day settings. The overall purpose of, of my research was to look at um, psychological flexibility and um, looking at that in a forensic setting. So it crossed across both low and medium secure settings. Um, as we mentioned, the literature is there for burnout, but it's less so on, on wellbeing. Um, and we want to try and contribute to that evidence base. I also thought I wanted to look at it because it might have some really useful implications for us in practice so how we can help support staff and how we can um, put things in place to better our understanding of that. 
I think someone spoke last week and made the reference to the to the Richard Branson quote, which is looking after the staff, it's looking after the patients that we work with. So if we can help there, it's going to have better outcomes in the longer term. The rationale um, for forensic settings was just that um, essentially we know that um, it's substantial levels of stress have tended to be found. Unfortunately, we work in um, environments where there actually there's um, behaviours that can be, including self-injury, for example, where a higher likelihood of coming across individuals who engage in suicidal behaviour and um, more dysregulation. So that in itself can take quite an emotional toil and burden on, on the staff working in those settings. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that well-being is impacted. Um, we know again now that if if not done something about it, if we don't intervene, that that impact that can be affected from that can impact effectiveness. We need to be effective in our jobs, in our roles. Um, we're responsible for taking care of really vulnerable, words out, vulnerable individuals. Um, so actually, if we know that the things that are impacting that then could cause a barrier to that or a harm to it, we need to take responsibility for doing something differently. Um, as mentioned before, we know that it's positively associated with well-being, um, which is why I want to look at that in a forensic environment. What were the, um, the hypotheses? What were the aims that I wanted to achieve? So overall, it should contribute to the literature. Um, but I also wanted to look if there was any differences in the type of roles that people had in organisations. We know in any healthcare settings, it doesn't rely solely on the people that work face to face with patients. There's lots of different roles, whether administrative, um, involving kind of like admissions. They might not have as much day to day contact with that. So I was interested to see if there's any difference in that in terms of their flexibility and well-being. But also um, within services, if there was a difference in the type of service and um, that people worked across so um, in the nature of the of, of Cheswell Park there is um, staff will work across various wards various services it might be that they work with acute patients whereas more opposed to patients that are in a more rehabilitative stream so it's keen to know actually if a staff member will work across are they more likely to have that flexibility whereas those work on one pathway for example So three um, hypotheses. The first was based on the literature that we know um, that actually those that have more flexibility are more likely to have um, increased psychological well-being. So that was the first and the primary hypothesis that are, that are looked at within within the research. Um, the second was that actually based on the information that we know that non-clinical, and that's um, um, staff working in the organisation that don't necessarily have direct patient contact and aren't kind of responsible for delivering treatment, et cetera, that actually they would maybe have um, more well-being present because of the fact that actually um, they're not necessarily dealing as much with that intense emotional label. So I was keen to see if that was going to be a difference and predicted that actually those in non-clinical roles would have more. And the third hypothesis that was predicted was that those that work across wards so or across services would have a greater level of psychological flexibility than those that are based on just one ward or service or within one role. So the idea that those that were generally having to adapt to things much more regularly and much more frequently would be more likely to have that increased level of psychological flexibility. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the methods, how we went about doing that. Um, it was really important, I felt, that we gathered as much information from a range of staff um, at, at the hospital. Um, we've got a high body of the support work staff, of the nursing staff. I wanted to get a range of, range of professionals. We do have professionals that are in roles that actually have some contact um, with, with the patients and doing a down there kind of daily, kind of having that input. Um, but we also have staff that have less of that, but do have some input, but maybe not to the same level of degree. So we were looking at um, administration staff, domestic staff, maintenance staff. So it really kind of looked across the board. Um, and it was also really important that we looked across those pathways as well. So sample was selected from um, learning disability service, uh, personality disorder service and, and the mental illness service. Um, yeah, finally, also we looked at whether we looked at age, looked at gender, um, and also whether staff working in clinical and non-clinical roles. The way we looked at that, though, was um, doing two, two measures. The first was um, something called the acceptance and action questionnaire, and this was developed also within the context of acceptance and commitment therapy. 
Um, and this measure is a short measure, uh, seven items, but a higher score on this would rate somebody's being more psychologically um, inflexible. So they're more likely to be quite rigid in their thinking um, and, and, and less willing and less likely to kind of experience emotions and, and feelings. Whereas those that scored at low will be seen to be higher flexible. The other way we looked at well-being was using RIF psychological well-being scales. Um, so this was a 42 item measure. I think we found um, when doing the pre-research that actually understanding the the nature of the role staff just wouldn't have the time to compete long measures. And we want it's more important to get those results rather than administering long scales that could have been in place. But it crossed a range of six dimensions. Um, here, which talks about in terms of autonomy, mastery, growth, I've got mentioned there. So those measures really covered that full range of well-being. I actually found the results of the demographics really interesting. Um, some of the things we found generally, we, we got 85 response rate, um, which was really positive given how um, frequently and difficult it can be to get some staff off the wards, especially those that are ward based. So we got a really good response rate. Um, 68 were females and 17 were males. The balance there um, wasn't quite there, but um, we did get a, a contribution of, from both. I also noticed it was also quite a range of people's experience within forensic settings. So we had those that were had no experience. So I think we had those just coming from um, um, induction who might have had less experience within that role. But we're also getting response rates from staff that had been there for, for years um, and, and over six years experience, which was really nice. So we're really getting that range there. Uh, I mean, age of uh, 37 uh, years. And also there was a bit of a balance in terms of clinical and non-clinical. Um, I think naturally we do have more staff that do work with patients. That was quite likely to be the case anyway, whereas um, there was less staff in terms of the organisation overall that have less of that patient contact. Um, and again, we had a bit of a split in terms of those that are based working on one pathway and those that work across the pathway. We took a summary of the means and um, so overall well-being and um, I think there's a slide in a moment that, that shows that but also the, the, the average mean there was 191 and um, the mean flexibility score we found was 18.86 which is actually comparable with the research that's already taken place and out there which looks at a non-clinical population compared to clinical populations which is much higher um, 28.3 so we our staff were actually comparable with that. One of the things I found really interesting from this actually is that the researchers um, of the of the psychometric suggest that those that fall with scores between 24 and 28 are much more likely to meet the cutoffs um, for measures such as um, depression or anxiety. And 24 of the staff that we found that responded to that actually had scores that were greater than that. So the scoring within um, within that scale has been suggested that could be meeting some of those cutoffs. And we either had a further 11 participants that scored between 29 to 44. So the much higher levels of psychological inflexibility. I thought had quite significant implications in terms of the nature of our role. If we've got staff that are scoring much higher in the inflexibility range, um, that's interesting for how we support those. If we've got staff that may be struggling and need that support when they're working with our patient groups, we need to be aware of that. We need to know that as an organisation and how we can support with that. That was really um, a useful bit of information from the research. A little bit about the hypothesis and the result. So the first hypothesis was made who actually yielded um, a significant result. So we we're predicting that those with more um, flexible psychological flexibility would have greater psychological well-being. And that, that was actually found to be the case. Um, it was yielding a significant result. Unfortunately, we don't know if it's cause and effect. So we don't know whether it's the flexibility that's increasing the well-being or actually is it that the um, psychological well-being, the staff that are taking care of their, um, their mental health and they're putting maybe things in place to increase that are able to be more psychological flex, um, psychologically flexible. So unfortunately, it doesn't give us a cause and effect, but we do know that it's related. Um, and yeah, we've got this gas plot that illustrates that relationship there. So we can see as the at the bottom there. So we've got um, the flexibility on the bottom, and that higher um, scores in the, in the 30s are more inflexible in terms of their range, um, and that corresponds with the lower levels of well-being there. So there's quite a significant correlation occurring. The second hypothesis. So that was looking at uh, non-clinical staff. Um, having greater well-being than those um, in, in clinical 
um, roles. What the results showed here was actually it was supportive in terms of the prediction of the, um, the direction in which that was looking. So the non-clinical staff did have higher levels of um, psychological well-being. It just didn't meet the cutoff for significance. I find that interesting. So it's not quite a significant level. So there's definitely um, roles and research we looked at in terms of maybe why that was the case. It could be the sample size, not quite sure why that might have been. Um, it might have just been occurring by chance. Um, but as we can see here, um, you kind of get the means are, are very close, so it's higher, but but not by much there. So it's definitely interesting in the longer term to kind of get a bit more understanding around that. Echoing with the, the third hypothesis, and um, that was in acting in a similar way. So those that worked across wards or services um, was predicted to have greater psychological flexibility. This had a similar um, outcome to the second hypothesis and that actually it followed the same direction. So we know that actually it was the case, but it wasn't reaching statistical significance. So it was following the direction as predicted, but just wasn't reaching that threshold that was there. Um, I think what will be really interesting actually in the, in the longer term is getting a lot more um, research in a qualitative way. These results are helpful and it allowed us to do it short term. It meant that we could get data back quickly, but actually what would be really useful was to, would be just to do some qualitative research, get that feedback from the staff that are working um, in this environment, get what their views are and actually find out what's, what's going on there about why that might be the case. the discussion of the research um, got through all actually we were able to explore the hypothesis that I wanted to look at and um, we found that the first hypothesis did yield a significant result um, but again as mentioned we're not quite sure whether that's cause or effect and um, what's interesting though it gives us that early kind of outcomes to be able to explore that further it's contributing to early research there's definitely scope to develop more and understanding in that area um, And actually, we know that um, the psychological flexibility is about being able to accept our own emotions and, and consider those in terms of our, our long term goals. So actually, if we're able to build on that, especially within a healthcare environment, if we're able to recognise and notice how we're experiencing a situation, we're much more likely to be able to act on that in a way that's more effective. Um, the research itself took part in a forensic setting so it's likely that at times staff will be experiencing fluctuating emotions might be anxiety and stress at times it's natural to want to avoid some of those difficult emotions at times but we know that in the longer term that's unhelpful and um, it can um, impact in terms of being able to cope in longer term situations if we're not having debriefs in that shorter moment um, or in the longer term either one of the things in terms of looking at the staff who had higher levels of psychological inflexibility. So at the beginning of, of the presentation, as, as referencing, there was, there was that volume of staff that was scoring higher. I'm starting to think about, well, what's the function of that? Why might that be effective in these kind of environments? Um, actually, it might be that if staff are exposed to kind of situations that might evoke strong emotional reactions or responses that are maybe unpleasant, and this is linking similarly into, into the pandemic that actually they're bound to be in lots of different situations where we're seeing other patients, family, service users, and those feelings really might be quite distressing. We naturally might want to avoid some of those. We might want to kind of just focus on the things at hand rather than noticing how that's impacting us. And um, so actually being aware of that is useful to know as an organisation, but also people that work um, with colleagues in direct mental health roles as well for how we can support each other as well in that capacity. any research with some limitations um, to the study and um, there's the um, the measure of the, the risk scales themselves um, have had varying ranges in terms of looking at the effectiveness of those scales and um, it could have actually been useful in the longer term to break those down to look at the independent the individual um, factors that were loading onto it and um, I think it would be useful for us to know if there's any particular parts of the well-being that's clo more closely linked to um, psychological flexibility. Um, equally, there's more and more scales coming out that are looking at well-being. Um, so kind of looking at that in a broader scale and looking at what might be best applied to forensic settings or healthcare settings overall um, could be something for a longer term piece of research in terms of looking at whether well-being maps onto a better scale potentially. Um, one of the things that we did notice as well was the term um, clinical and non-clinical. 
we understood that actually on speaking to staff um, during afterwards that people had different interpretations of that role um, so some staff were perceiving it as people who specifically have roles involved in um, in treatment and, and providing that other staff were interpreting that um, a bit more about having day-to-day -day work with patients so actually we need to be making sure that what's understood by that concept that was a bit of a limitation with the study um, and actually that would be really useful in the longer term then for doing qualitative research just having those one-to-one -one interviews with staff um, and making it clear in terms of what that role would involve and how they feel about that. There were some implications so um, and generally before thinking about what the implications might be for COVID-19 was that um, research has shown that this acceptance and commitment therapy in the workplace has been shown to found, have reduced stress and sick leave. Um, so therefore, if we know, for example, that a staff member or a particular group of staff members in different healthcare environments um, have high levels of psychological inflexibility, these are some of the options that we might be wanting to consider. Um, at the first brown point, it'll be thinking about just giving them support, giving information around that, but there are therapies and interventions out there that could be useful. Furthermore, there's been lots of research about the validity of the AAQ, which has been really positive, um, and it has been shown to be a predictor of staff ill health. So that in itself could be useful for thinking about if we've got staff coming into healthcare settings, whether it's forensic or otherwise, um, having an understanding of their ability to be psychologically flexible might be useful in terms of impacting absenteeism, presenteeism and general staff turnover. That's good for organisations to be aware of about how we can utilise that. I did go away though and think about how does this research then impact on or can be impacted by the by the pandemic so how does it cross over we know that um the response rate from after the pandemic is, is still going on so we are looking positively towards things looking up but we know that actually it's still continuing we're not out of that there the British Psychological Society actually talk about a recovery phase and actually that actually staff will need a lot of time afterwards to reflect on that and process a lot of the experiences that have been occurring. Um, people will like to have their own methods of coping and there'll be different types of coping that will have been put in place during the pandemic. But actually people might need a lot more individual resources um, externally, but also internally as well if they can develop their own resources. Others we know might have been changed in a more positive way. So that concept of post-traumatic growth, um, if somebody's kind of quite psychological, flexible anyway, and they've got those resources in place, they might have um, been able to use those to um, increase their own well-being, their own resilience that's been there. I'm not quite sure. Um, but we also might have those that might have this kind of feeling that they should have done things differently. Um, we've not been in a global pandemic like this before, so it's bound to have a lot of, we should have done this, could we have done this differently? And that kind of general culture on that can have an impact on well-being if they're thinking that they haven't done things as well as they might have liked to do. Um, we know there's bound to be um, individual differences in terms of wider family and social impacts. I know a lot of the, few of the speakers today have spoken about that in terms of how it's impacted them day to day, but also the, the ripples that have impacted that. So making sure that we're aware both individually but also as organisations of those settings and how we can support that will be really useful ongoing. Um, and yes, yeah, so we know that organisations actually will play a really responsible role in supporting that. It's the staff that are looking after the patients. So we as organisations need to make sure that we're doing as much as we can to support that in the longer term. The final slide there is that there are some key principles from, from the BPS about um, how we respond well in this recovery phase. So what do we need to maintain well-being for the future? Well, it's really important that we give our time to take stock really i think we people need different um, levels of resources some people can um kind of process that as they go along and accessing the right resources others might need more time afterwards and um, but making sure that we don't just kind of return straight back to business as usual kind of phrase let's just get back to it it's something that we've not seen before we need that time to process it afterwards um, and making sure if we can that actually organize events activities um to kind of show that support it might be that staff will need that in a different way so if organizations can be creative and look at how we provide that that's going to be really useful um, and i think as people have said a few times before as well it's that we give that kind of recognition of that thanks that actually the staff in healthcare settings especially in the pandemic are going massively beyond 
um, above and beyond day to day work in a healthcare setting, we're having to manage things we've not managed before, and just that recognition have a massive impact. Um, an ongoing kind of assessment for staff in terms of what has worked well. There will be things, if I think the last speaker was speaking about as well, in terms of working from home, there'll be definitely areas of that that's, that's worked well. So what can we take from that, even after the pandemic, and using that in the longer term, um, as well as what we might want to do differently. And finally, kind of just thinking about ongoing peer support um, within the kind of organisation itself. So um, Chesel Park, we've, that's what we've been doing and that has been working really well. So even now when kind of things are slowly kind of positively impacting in terms of um, patients are getting out more, people are feeling a bit more reassured about how things are going, we are still seeing that actually staff still need that peer support. They're fluctuating day to day and there's, there's no time frame for when that might be. So actually as long as we're continuing to do that work and how we should be. Thank you. Not any questions at the moment and um, open the discussions if anybody's got any questions I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Hand you back over to Professor Namagata. Thank you very much Debbie. That was a wonderful talk and uh, thank you very much for sharing your research and certainly this has furthered our understanding uh, and knowledge base in this important area of burnout. So I'll take the opportunity to um, speak about, to ask Grace Day to join us to speak about um, another important area, burnout and personality types. Um, although it is not part of our program, I thought it is apt for her to join us to share her research findings in relation to burnout and personality types. Grace Day has uh, been working at Chesterfield Park Hospital for the last five and a half years. Um, she worked as a trainee assist. Uh, she worked as a psychology assistant and then trainee assistant or trainee psychologist. And um, she has obtained her master's degree from Teesside University. And her research topic is burnout and personality types. So I think it's my privilege to invite her to join us to share her summary of findings and also her insights into this key area. Over to you, Grace. Thank you, Shikantha. So just, yeah, first off, um, echo Debbie's um, thanks to you and other senior teams at, um, at Cheswell Park for supporting the research. I think it's really important that we're, um, you know, continuing to develop the research and it helps us understand how best to support staff and patients um, also within the pandemic as well. Um, can you see my slides there? We Yes, we, we can see your slides, yes. Yes. Um, just start this then. So, yeah, as um, Professor Nimagada um, said, that I completed some research uh, in my master's in, uh, a couple of years ago, but I think it's really fitting to talk about within the pandemic, really. Um, and some of it fits nicely with what other people have been discussing about stress um, and uh, psychological well-being. Uh, generally, we know we know a lot about what burnout is. We know it's a stress-related phenomenon. Um, we know that it's more likely to happen with people that have got interpersonal jobs, and it can lead to symptoms of withdrawal, strained relationships, reduced performance, um, cause physical um, unwell, uh, it affects family life. So it's really important that we consider how to identify this and how best to support people that are experiencing burnout. Um, Maslock obviously developed um, a questionnaire that helped us to understand the different factors within um, burnout, so depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and personal accomplishment. And there's been lots of questions about how these um, kind of the trajectory of, the, of burnout. Um, but ultimately, we think that these are the three factors that people might experience if they become burnt out. And I think this is it's really important with interpersonal jobs and within healthcare that we understand. Um, understand these really because obviously if someone's experiencing burnout that's going to affect how they um, support their patients and how they work with within teams as well so supporting staff also helps us to support patients better um, some of these are the uh, this is some of the ideas of the trajectory of burnout and um, so there's questions about what which one starts and um, but ultimately um, it suggested that depersonalization is a maladaptive way of coping to bur uh, with burnout and stressors. Um, so it's, it's really important that we, we capture that so that we can support and stop it from leading to emotional exhaustion. 
So some of these, um, uh, the ideas of what might start burnout, so having a lack of positive support, having um, reduced social support, reduced perceived control, um, putting high expectations on ourselves, um, and also, you know, workload um, and the amount of reward that we get. And I, th I think it's important just to reflect on how much COVID's had an impact on that in that um, obviously our social support, social support has reduced. Um, we've got not, we haven't got very much control over the situation. Um, we also are putting more expectations on, our, on ourselves, trying to support a lot of people and managing the situation that's really stressful. So I think that's just a point for me to, to acknowledge that the etiologies of burnout has probably increased during the pandemic. So my, um, my research focused on looking at the differences, um, uh, the individual differences between people and why some people might become burnt out and why others don't, um, especially within a forensic service. I also considered whether this was um, different for the different diagnosis that people worked with and the different pathways. Um, so the, we considered the big five personality types. Um, so extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism and openness and considered whether this was, um, these were related. Um, previous research has found that neuroticism um, linked highly with burnout and emotional exhaustion, um, but that if you had higher resilience that you show, it showed to reduce burnout. So this is just some previous research that showed that um, it's burnout, in, um, it's prevalent in forensic services, um, probably due to the, the different levels of, of stress and the fluctuating emotions that Debbie pointed out about um, the anxiety that uh, staff may feel. Um, um, yeah, so my focus focused mainly on how personality related to that and whether if, if the pathways would change or have a moderating impact on the level of burnout and that would hopefully lead us to be able to support staff better um, and, and how we could um, in, in support them in reducing the impact. So that just um, highlights my hypothesis. So the personality traits will be related to burnout. In particular, I thought that neuroticism, um, high neuroticism scores would lead to increased levels of burnout. And I also, also hypothesized that um, working on a learning disability ward, um, people might experience less burnout um, and this bit would be a moderating variable. I had 100 people um, complete the, the, SF, the uh, study for me. So I found that um, all factors um, were used in the preliminary exploration. However, only noticism, resilience and openness um, were fairly distributed. So these were the ones that I mainly focused on. So it, what, what we found was that resilience predicted um, professional efficacy. Um, meaning that if you're higher resilience, you're more protective from burnout and neuroticism predicted exhaustion. So the more neurotic, the more emotionally exhausted you might feel. Again, this just um, supported kind of other research, really, that high neuroticism, um, you might engage in less um, effective coping skills um, and so have higher associated burnout. Um, so my main kind of reflection from this is that um, the more support, so if, if those, those that had higher resilience had less burnout and therefore if we can support staff to increase their resilience, provide them with coping skills um, to help manage their neuroticism, it might in decrease the levels of burnout that's experienced. And I think this is really important within COVID who those that show um, high on neuroticism are probably feeling very anxious about the, uh, the pandemic, even more anxious than maybe what um, someone who's got more resilience. So if we can provide staff with these coping skills and increase their resilience, it could go some way to help them feel supported and help them to um, not suffer the uh, implications of burnout. Um, so that was just a quick synopsis really of my study, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Kent. Shrikant, you are muted, so you'll have to you'll have to repeat what you said, please. 
Yeah, you are muted. Uh... Okay. Uh, thank you, Debbie and Grace, uh, for your uh, talks and also um, your insights into this useful area of uh, burnout. Please uh, stay with us, and um, uh, the delegates can ask questions in the discussion time. So we'll, we'll move. We'll move on to the last topic of the day. Uh, this is uh, by Professor Colonel Derek de Souza. He is going to talk us talk to us about honing emotional intelligence skills at workplace to face post-COVID era. I think it's my privilege to introduce him today. Um, Professor Colonel de Souza is presently the director of the National Center for Bioethics Curriculum Implementation at Mimar College, Pune, and he's a decorated army officer with over 22 years of service to the country. He has published a number of chapters in books on healthcare and also biomedical ethics. He has conducted a number of workshops in bio bioethics communication and also soft skills and trained medical students, postgraduate residents, and also medical cadets over the years. Today, he is uh, going to talk to us on the area of emotional intelligence the Daniel Goldman's conceptualization of emotional intelligence, and he is going to highlight how it is going to relate to uh, individuals, leaders in organizations to enhance productivity. Particularly, one of the key things that I've learned about emotional intelligence is unlike personality and IQ, uh, some of the competencies of emotional intelligence can be learned, and he's going to highlight what are the challenges the post-COVID era is going to pose and how individuals can learn some of the skills in his presentation. So over to you, Derek. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Srikant. And uh, really, it is a pleasure and an honor to be invited and to be given a chance to speak to such a distinguished audience from all over the world. And uh, I'm glad that uh, we managed to put all this uh, together. So thank you once again. It's wonderful to be part of the IOPM and to be speaking here this evening. So uh, before I start, I want to place on record uh, my gratitude to Professor Russell D'Souza, the Dean of the International Institute of Organizational Psychological Medicine, I think it was just uh, my good fate and luck that I happened to uh, come in contact with uh, Professor Russell and Professor Mary Matthew, uh, not in Pune, surprisingly, but all the way in Gangtok, Sikkim. It's been almost five years now that we've been working together, and very sincerely, my life has been transformed. So much of what we'll be discussing today is uh, all part of my interaction and learning from Professor Russell D'Souza. So all credit uh, goes to him. If there are any lapses, then I am to blame for that. So let's uh, start by trying to just understand what exactly are our intelligences. When we talk about intelligence, it's uh, just spoken in a very general manner. And since we do have a number of uh, students and other faculty who are here who uh, may be understanding these concepts or learning of these concepts for the first time. So I'm going to go into a little bit of basics for that, and I hope you will pardon me while we go ahead. So broadly, when we talk about intelligences or the fact that there are multiple intelligences, and we've seen from the previous presenter as well that you had how all this is connected with even personality type. So on similar lines, you have physical intelligence, cognitive intelligence, and more latest as the understanding has developed, emotional and most recently of all, spiritual intelligence. So coming to the first type, physical intelligence is refers to our body skills, use of the skills that we have. So to just give you an example, a newborn infant, for example, has very little physical intelligence, and even it struggles to find its vision, lift its head, but gradually they are able to focus, they are able to control their body, 
first rate turnover, and these are all considered to be milestones of development. Now, most of us, me included, have an average development on the physical intelligence or physical quotient, but an Olympic athlete, somebody who plays sports, or even a dancer or a martial arts expert would rate very high on the physical intelligence scale. On the other hand, cognitive intelligence, more commonly understood as IQ, deals with mathematical, linguistic, or even strategic planning. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why IQ for a very long time, and even today where you have your various entrance examinations, or you go for an interview, so there will be a couple of questions related to your IQ, or they want to test your IQ. The reason being that it is normally associated with serial thinking and a rational thought process, and therefore, the various IQ tests will measure this. On the other hand, it was Salovey and Mayer who, way back in 1990, first established this term of emotional intelligence. So they spoke of it as a different skill set, which deals with expression of emotion, not only in oneself, but able to recognize it in others, to effectively regulate such emotion, both within yourself and others as well, and how you can master your emotions to motivate, plan, and improve your achievements in life. This whole thought and idea was taken forward by Daniel Goleman and Richard Boyatic, and they spoke about four classes of what they called it as relationship skills. So these relationship skills deal with self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and last but not the least, empathy. So related to these relationship skills, came to the idea of having emotional self-control. So you could understand how your emotions are taking control and how you can avoid losing that control. And that was the whole idea that they had developed. So under these four skills, they had sub sections as it were. So under self-awareness, it was emotional self-awareness. Where it came to self-management, control of your emotion, adaptability to the situation, achievement orientation, and above all, having a positive outlook. In terms of social awareness, it would be empathy, which is very highly rated, especially in the healthcare profession. And for those who are working in an organization, to be aware of your surroundings, to be aware of what is happening around you. And coming to the relationship management, because all of us are social creatures and we have a lot of relationship going on with the other. So how does one person influence the other? Coach and mentor people who are there with you, whether it be in your schools and colleges or even in the workplace. How to manage conflict, how to work together as a team, and most important, how to have inspirational leadership. Very recently, just at the turn of the century, we had this new concept of spiritual intelligence. And Zohar and Marshall have taken this forward. And this was another milestone of how the mind works. So I just want to clarify that spiritual intelligence has nothing to do with religion. It is just called spiritual intelligence because as the definition goes, it looks as the intelligence by which we solve problems of meaning and value. We start to look at our actions and our life in a wider, richer, and meaning-giving context. So we don't just think of life as just something that happens, but trying to understand what is the higher function of life. So if we were to put this in a pyramid, PQ would be at the lowest and earliest level, as we develop and go to schools and colleges, our IQ keeps going higher. As we mature and understand the surroundings and understand society and start working, we understand how we can manage ourselves and our relationships. 
and finally at the peak we develop not only in our wisdom but this is guided by compassion and ultimately we would like to reach this place of equanimity that is you have both inner and outer peace so you are put into a difficult situation you are in a challenging situation but you are able to detach yourself from that and you are able to find peace you don't react violently you don't lose your temper you don't have uh, a love that stress to manipulate you into being detrimental for you and others as well so i read this very beautiful quote and i would like to share it with you that it's not just us as human beings having a spiritual experience but rather we are spiritual beings having a human experience so almost every religion in this case i'll just come back to that talks about us having a higher plane of existence higher reason for existence and this just being a path that we have to follow so let's keep that in mind so if we look at this in a more scientific and diagrammatical way we see that mostly the iq dealing with serial processing is traditionally supposed to be in the left brain and eq or emotional intelligence happens in the right brain and this is what distinguishes an artist from a author or a scholar or maybe a nobel prize winner but spiritual intelligence has been shown to have a synchronous processing where both the right brain and left brain will work together now what is the context of this with leadership we know that leadership itself the leader or whoever is the person who's going to influence the followers he has a strong bearing on what the outcomes of the performance were and you can see the references there as well so leadership or the way that effective leader or leaders who are really known and talked about and people follow them is because of the emotional control so the leaders are able to recognize the various emotional states that the followers would be in they attempt to evoke positive emotions in the follower and where negative emotions are developing they would like to manage the emotional state accordingly pescolido in 2002 he again showed by his research that leaders were able to increase the solidarity of a group as well as morale by creating shared emotional experiences so people develop a much deeper connect to their workplace deeper connect to their fellow colleagues and again this is what uh, dr avinash had alluded to that this is the disconnect that people felt when they were working from home and again the leader will not only recognize this emotion but can influence the emotional climate and that is why you find most of the successful leaders are well known because of not only their personality traits but the fact that people loved that culture in which they had to work for so immediately as i am speaking so many um, outcomes would possibly come whether it be dr devi shetty and the hospitals or steve jobs or the whole um, famous whatever blue chip companies that you speak to whether it was henry ford or any of the other leaders lee ayakoka all of them they were able to develop such a strong emotional climate and that is what got the performance from the workers so this we have to understand that when a leader is able to transform the teams that are working under him also transform and ultimately what is the net benefit we can see that productivity or rather output so it need not be simply in a factory or a office setting but it could be in a college it could be in a healthcare setting it could even be in the house where each one of us especially as parents is able to act as a leader and transform the situation wherever it may be now as we come to a new post covid world and this is going to become more and more familiar what we urgently need is emotionally intelligent leader and this is definitely the need of the hour 
And do these emotionally intelligent leaders have the right set of tools to handle the employees, to handle the situation? And this is what we're going to consider. So these are some of the tools that I feel leaders should have. One is self-awareness. So this would be knowing what I believe in, what my values are, and what are the things that motivate me. Spontaneity, we know that everyone likes to be spontaneous, or even whether it's in a party or in a college or at a picnic, the people who are spontaneous are always being, uh, people go and gather around them, they are attracting people, and very often we uh, refer to them as being the life of the party. Because they live in and are responsive to the moment. Again, a good value is being to have a vision and values and use these principles and beliefs to channel your life and be a role model. To have a uh, spirit of holism. So when I say holism, to look at the larger picture, not just to react to a situation, but to realize when it is better to walk away from a difficult situation to lose the battle, as it were, to win the war. Compassion and empathy, of course, there's no doubt about it. Extremely important in our healthcare setting. But even otherwise, to have compassion and empathy means to be able to understand, to walk in the shoes of other people. Again, celebration of diversity, extremely important, where we can value people for their differences and not despite them. So you are able to bring out the good in people, understand that each one of us has different talents and work accordingly. An important characteristic and one that is very, very uh, much in demand is to have field independence. And this means to be able to stand up for one conviction. It's as if like a general is standing in the middle of the battlefield and leading his troops not really bothered whether he's putting himself at risk, how dangerous the situation is, but to be able to stand up. And this is recognized in all the leaders that we know. Humility at the same time, because as we know, if you allow your ego to get away from you, it can be detrimental after some time. Whereas humility, to understand that you are just a player in a larger drama, you can do a lot of good, but there are others who can be better than you as well. Again, leaders are not scared to ask why, because they are co-learners, they are constant learners, like uh, we had uh, Pratiksha tell us, that she still considers herself a constant learner. And if we continue to learn, you are the best uh, person to benefit at the end of the day. Again, an ability Hello, to... Ravi. It's, it's important to, one time, back, I, it's, to it's take true. a step back from the situation and see how things pan out. To be able to use adversity, and again, a huge reminder of this year 2020, where we had the entire COVID situation, but we were able to learn from it. And finally, a sense of vocation of being called as a service and to be able to give back something to society. And I think once we have all these tools with us, we are able to actually face up to this almost uh, hopeless situation that we felt ourselves some time back and be able to not only correct the situation, but to be able to right the wrong. So most of important in a post-COVID world will be the control of emotion. We saw that people allowed their emotions to literally run out of control, whether it was because of the constant messages, of the constant feedback that came from the media, from newspapers, and people felt helpless because there was this overwhelming tsunami of emotions, and they found it very, very difficult to cope with all of that. So how do we do? When there is stress or anger or worry, it's important to recognize this and be able to calm one's system. To divert negative and destructive ideas, ideas of failure, ideas of helplessness, to a more positive channel, somewhere where you can say, no, we can do it. We can face this together. We need to join hands together. And we found even in 
the last talks where we had uh, the various um, heads of the hospital tell us how they were able to get people to come back and not give up. And that's what led them to success in the future. To recognize if there is any catastrophic impulse, because you feel like uh, so many people said that healthcare workers wanted to run up and give, go home. But if you realize that that could be catastrophic to society, you are able to control your emotions and change the situation. Most important is to be able to understand your own mood, because however much you hide, you cannot fool yourself. And again, to have this distinction between a thought, a feeling, how do you conduct yourself and be able to look inside and see, do you have any prejudice against another person, either overtly or even covertly? So what are some of the leadership tips? Listening is very, very important because when you listen to someone, you get purpose, you get focus, and of course, you get curiosity to understand the situation. You can always ask relevant and focused questions depending on the situation. Invite people to give you ideas and action plans. Somebody's plan may be much better than what you could have imagined. So be open to that. Encourage others. Encourage the juniors. Inspire them by your leadership and recognize good qualities in people. It's important to delegate authority, but with wisdom and thoughtfulness. Again, something that Pratiksha told us earlier in the day, that delegate doesn't mean handing over responsibility passing the buck as it were, but to delegate authority where it is possible, where people can actually do a good job. And finally, to develop a culture of consistent accountability. So people understand that they have a responsibility, but it is not just simply a blame game. So in the post-COVID world, what we need to understand, one is importance of our own and our colleagues' safety. We found there was a huge number of healthcare professionals who actually got COVID and unfortunately some of them are not here with us, they are no more. And if you go by the way that they acted, it was almost foolhardy at times, so not really something that needs to be emulated. Unfortunately, there were and still are unethical practices by the profession, where people went into hoarding masks, hoarding sanitizers, hospitals started taking advantage of people so not something that we're very proud about. And we need to look introspect and find out who and why such things are happening because unfortunately, the whole profession gets a bad name. Discipline ourselves and our society. Be united to face the challenges. Share knowledge and of course technology because we've seen how important technology, even today I'm sitting here in Pune in my office and being able to discuss these issues with you all across the world. And finally, a respect for each other's profession. So what are the lessons for the future? What are the building blocks that we can count on? Have strong foundations. In whichever institution you are, build a strong foundation. If you haven't done it till now, doing a SWOT analysis, that is strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. This you need to understand very clearly to prepare for adversity. Unfortunately, the whole world was caught on the wrong foot as it was when this pandemic hit. There was a feeling of complacency. We thought everyone is having a good time. Nothing can really go wrong. And that's when this tiny virus literally changed the world in a way that we could never think possible. We should think of being self-reliant and self-sufficient. So if borders are closed, if exports are closed, your society, your institution does not suffer. To be able to think out of the box and innovate with new ideas and think of ways to better the future. So if we have good and positive thinking, that changes our attitudes and beliefs. It tells us that we can do something, we can change our behavior, and then we will see very positive results. Having seen those positive results, that will inspire a new way of thinking. So this is a very positive life cycle that we can take back with us and use this to go ahead in the days to come. So as we come to an end, I would like to remind you that change starts with you, but it doesn't start until you do. 
unfortunately <laughs> ladies and gentlemen we attend these seminars we attend these workshops and we feel very good about it and we say okay i have i've even noted down a, comp- a whole set of ideas but we need to put it into practice we need to change ourselves and only then we can change society and change the future as it were so thank you very much for a uh, patient listening it has truly been an honor and a wonderful experience to be here if there are any questions or comments i will take it now and once again to place on record my appreciation to dr russell and the entire team of iopm and congratulations to dr shrikant and his team from the academic center for a wonderful conference it's really been marvelous attending and being given a chance to present thank you and have a nice evening thank you very much derek for the wonderful talk and certainly emotional intelligence is an area of great interest to me over the years and um, daniel goldman in his uh, seminal paper um, what makes a leader um, he makes a comment that emotional intelligence is a sine qua non of good leadership essentially it is a magical in- in- ingredient which separates or sets out good leaders from bad leaders so that is one ingredient that enriches or enhances uh, organizational productivity and certainly you have captured uh, various themes of emotional intelligence and in particular i want to highlight that some of the emotional intelligence competencies that are highlighted by goldman and other authors over the years are some of the things that can be learned and again through self reflection and constant learning and you have encapsulated the whole theme in a beautiful way and please stay with us for discussion we have 20 minutes for discussion and the speakers from this session will be taking questions and i have requested the speakers from the first session also to join us so that if there is any burning questions from the audience they can address it as well okay um i think we have a question for you in the chat box uh, dr isosa derek yes yes i i saw that uh, from uh, trupti and um, exactly you are absolutely right because uh, can I, being can i uh, highlight the question to the audience if yeah please say. please you you can i think trupti koli is asking derek does emotional intelligence increase resilience yes thank you uh, trupti for that and you are absolutely right because once you are emotionally intelligent once you are able to understand your emotion and understand how your emotions can very quickly take control of you and take you on a downward spiral you are able to put yourself in any difficult situation and not lose your uh, peace mm-hmm. of mind not lose your temper and you are able to handle the situation better so automatically all these are externally seen as resilient very often we say that oh that person is cool that professor is cool that doctor is very cool he doesn't lose his uh, himself however catastrophic the situation is there he is able to take a step back and say okay team let's handle it there's no panic and that ends up with good outcome so you are absolutely right as you develop your emotional intelligence are you as able to control your emotion your resilience your ability to face difficult situations and bounce back from them definitely improves uh, dr rasul would you like to add on something to that no that you that and resilience yeah no i think we are given a good answer yes the re- uh, emotional intelligence certainly will improve resilience uh, definitely because uh, ultimately of course um, for as you alluded um, the ultimate intelligence now is uh, we talk about the ability to um, to have inner and outer peace isn't it which comes from, and, and meaningfulness which Uh, which comes from the spiritual intelligence which is um, again um, uh, um, f- uh, further up from the emotional intelligence 
And that's why it's called the ultimate intelligence. But I think all these together reflect uh, resilience. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So going back uh, to the audience again, any questions for the, for, for the other speakers? Please post it or I'll be happy to unmute you. Whilst we are waiting for questions, I um, am receiving feedback or I mean requests in terms of certificates, CPT certificates. I would like to say, uh, very happy to send you CPT certificates. Um, I'll be sending a, a, a feedback survey to you very shortly, maybe in the next few days. And if you can briefly complete that, uh, I think we can send you the CPT certificate because uh, there are a number of registrations, nearly 300 registrations for this conference. And it is very um, uncertain for us who have attended from these registrations. So completing a feedback survey, a brief feedback survey would enable us to understand uh, how things went well today. And if there is anything that we need to change, um, talks for the future conferences, and also any suggestions in terms of how we can improve the IAEOPM further. Um, and certainly we'll be sending you the CPT certificate as well. Also, I would like to say that the academic center uh, will be sending regular blogs and articles in various areas of um, IEO organization psychological medicine in the weeks to come on a regular basis. So please register your interest with IAEOPM or ask your colleagues to register their interest because some of you who have attended today, we have your email, so you'll get automatic emails. Please share it with your colleagues so that we can spread the message of what IAEOPM is um, highlighting to the rest of the colleagues in other organizations um, so that, I mean, people will be much more um, up to speed with some of these issues that we talked today. Derek, any questions that you can see coming in the chat box? Uh, no, somebody just asked uh, how to send the feedback or they're waiting for the link. So maybe you could clarify that as well. I think, uh, uh, again, as I mentioned, we'll be sending you a feedback form very shortly in the next few days. And if you can complete that, uh, that will be very useful. Anything else you want to comment, um, Derek, or any other speakers want to join and ask any questions or clarify anything from other speakers today? No, I think today all the speakers uh, that we had, unfortunately, some of them are not uh, there because uh, of uh, the commitment. But I think they each one exemplified whether it was Pratiksha or last week, uh, Tony, and uh, of course, uh, Giri himself, uh, who took us through each of the phases as a patient, as a physician or a healthcare professional, and finally as the director of yeah. the hospital. And I think they were the embodiment yeah. of what we concluded today. With, with I have a question. I am so, receiving some feedback. Um, yes. Let me go back to the speakers. I think we have a question from Dr. Gillian Kirk, uh, who is asking. Yes. Um, the speakers, if they have one recommendation each to share with the rest of us about building our own resilience, which has worked for them personally. So she's asking this is a question to each speaker. Um, and I think I'll unmute all the speakers. Please share one recommendation as requested by Dr. Kirk that essentially highlights how you can build your own resilience um, and give a personal example of that. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask Debbie to comment first. She, I can see her there on the screen. Yeah, thank you, Shukan. Um, I think for me personally, I think it's been practicing mindfulness of my own emotions and experiences. I think being able to fit in that kind of in with, the, with the topic that I've been speaking about, which is flexibility, um, involves a process of being able to be aware of, of what's going on, whether it's positive or negative. So I think for me, um, the more I practice and become aware of my own feelings or response to a situation has helped the, the resilience element of it because it helps me to then know whether I need to do anything about that, whether it's a positive affect or, or a negative one. Um, and the more I practice that, I actually find that the more that comes up, I feel more confident that I can manage that um, longer term. So for me, that's mindfulness of my own self helps increase my resilience, I would say. 
thank you for that response to the um i see uh, avinash has joined us i think our first speaker um avinash would you like to share your insight um, your personal insight into that yes uh, i think uh, the one personal insight i will tell people is that uh, 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 for building your own resilience is that uh, love your home be in your home enjoy yourself and uh, you know learn to sort of balance your work life and i think that will build your resilience in a big way fantastic fantastic response and uh, we also have grace um, grace is there anything you would like to share uh, yeah well i suppose i i think about the the things that are related to causing bur burnout are things like not having the social support or putting too much pressure on um, not having any, any control over your life. And I think that right at the beginning of the pandemic, the guidance was about getting exercise and staying connected and, um, you know, controlling the things that you can. And I think that's really important. And I think for me, it's been about being socially connected and seeking support when needed and trying to reduce the pressure that we put on ourselves. Very useful. Thank you very much, Grace, for that. Derek, I'm, I'm getting some comments and feedback in my chat box. Um, yeah. While I'm retrieving, retrieving it, would you like to share your insight? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Srikant. Again, my personal example that uh, there were a lot of things that we thought we could never do or we could not accomplish. Whether it was just having um, everybody on lockdown and being able to manage, people were actually wondering that how do you go through weeks and weeks of lockdown? And yet that is the time solidarity came to the forefront. You found how neighbors got together. These small shops who were in the locality would take the risk of putting half their shutters down or having a back door from which you would get your essential supplies. So humanity showed through very, very strongly. Again, even coming to the whole concept of uh, education where you had schools which were closed, medical colleges, which were closed and people were wondering that what is going to happen? Are we going to lose months or are we going to use a complete year? And I still remember the first Zoom class uh, that I took and uh, one of uh, the students, again, possibly trying to learn something himself, decided to do a bit of scribbling and coloring on the screen. So all my slides were, were difficult to read because uh, it may have just been that he was playing or maybe he was reading something else, but it left a lot of colored scribbles all over the screen. And then we learned of, of how to stop uh, screen sharing by others, how to avoid interruption, how to mute other people. And I can see Dr. Russell nodding in agreement. He knows how we went through this learning curve. And today we are able to conduct this almost flawlessly, having so many people joining together, sharing the screen and with minimal uh, interruptions. Even our medical college, uh, when we came back and we took a feedback at the end as the students are coming, we found most of the course content was completed and we could now just focus on the face-to-face -face practical part of it. Um, where earlier you only thought that uh, IT was the one field which could work from home. Uh, and we saw how Avinash told us that possibly there was no real field, including the medical field, where people were able to work from home, telemedicine has suddenly come into a big way. Even a field such as mine of dentistry, we found most of the people we could just help on a telephone call or maybe a video call and be able to give them some relief from their pain. So my take home message is to have an open mind. The minute we close our mind and simply say it is not possible, this can't be done, we and the profession lose out. But if you have an open mind and say, okay, let's do it. This is the problem. Let's find a solution. Throughout history, we've seen, we've been able to find solutions for the worst of problems and the worst of time. So we've got through this pandemic. Hopefully the worst is behind us. And I think the future will be bright, provided we don't forget these lessons. Unfortunately, we forget the lessons possibly faster than we learn them. So let's keep these lessons in mind. Let's use them, like I said, use those building blocks to build up our character, build up our resilience, and build up our institutions and our workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Derek, for that. 
and uh, we have pratiksha patel uh, she want to make some comments or uh, uh, share some thoughts over to you dr patel thank you i had a question uh, i mean very interesting the uh, topics this afternoon uh, thank you very much for all the speakers uh, uh debbie here i had a really i mean this is very new topic for me as well and very interesting insights in terms of the psychological flexibility of the person and how it can predict uh, their how the personality will play a role in the workplace uh is that uh, a, a fixed phenomenon or does it change over time that's a really good question um i think it changes over time um i think it's the, the concept of of psychological psychological flexibility is about being present um being open and and doing what's effective i think over time it it takes our experience over time to be able to recognize that so our ability to be open and based on our experience through adolescence through to adulthood gives us more recognition of um the things to be open to essentially i think so actually i'd imagine um marriage is not focused on over time but actually from the research that I have read that it is it, it is changed over time is dependent on the experiences that we have so it might be that it's fixed depends on a certain context or um if we're in an environment that's not supportive of that um but i imagine it's quite fluid in that way yeah that that is thank you very much uh, and i think more more or less i would like to understand that what can organization do to to increase the flexibility of the individuals yeah definitely thank you very much for that response uh, debbie thanks so i'm just mindful of time we have completed the program dot on time thank you very much all the speakers and also the participants for the discussion it was very engaging very stimulating and a fascinating and wonderful day so far and uh, certainly i'll come back to you with, with with more information in relation to the initiatives of iaopm so i want to end the conference with a vote of thanks to Firstly, I want to thank Professor De Souza for his energy, passion, and commitment in terms of driving some of these initiatives forward. Certainly, he is my mentor and also um, a true friend who has guided me in terms of moving things forward in relation to IAOPM. And uh, I also want to thank um, the uh, the various colleagues on the IAOPM board for their support. They've extended over, extended over the years in terms of furthering. um various initiatives myself and uh, professor de souza have embarked on um thank you to them uh, personally i also want to thank um the chesswell park hospital um board and uh, in particular i want to thank tony gaty and dr pearson who have always supported me and extended their um uh, support at every level over the years in terms of uh, promoting uh, various aspects of iaopm and certainly the fact that academic center is based here is a reflection of their support to um support to me over the years to um further this area of research and uh, um and and the objectives of the iaopm so on that note i think i want you to um stay safe and please uh, stay in touch stay connected with iaopm and um, i'm hoping that once this pandemic is completely blown over at some point again we can have a live conference hopefully next year and we can again meet in person and exchange some of the ideas we shared today thank you very much for joining us thank you thank you shrikant and congratulations for a wonderful job that you've done thanks to all our members uh, fellows board members and all the participants derek and all uh, for your contribution where is princey mary all our team uh it's been great successful and uh, so all of you stay well stay safe we will meet again uh the, as you can see so much of we are doing a lot of work in this area i'm delighted to see peer at last uh, <laughs> from a great friend uh, he's been with us uh, he and uh, florence his wife was a board member too Yes, so it's been great, and uh, um, I think it's been a wonderful two, uh, two great days. Much of these areas are not really covered in most conferences. Would you you would agree? And the variety, and also the number of 
disciplines that have taken uh, joined us in this all all to do with workforce and workplace well-being and 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 so forth okay thank you and thank stay you, safe and say well and till we meet again right i'm speaking from melbourne where it's uh, quarter to 3 in the in the morning okay all right see you bye 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 Hello, Derek. Derek. Uh, thank you very much. But also, congratulations to both of us. Fantastic. I think uh, I can't thank you well enough. Uh, but, uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, yes, and also, Derek, we, at a personal level, we both should work a lot. I think uh, I will, I've realized our wavelengths are more or less the same in once we focus on things we want to achieve them so very both of us are very committed individuals and i think we'll we'll pick up uh, some themes that we both can work yes excellent and your your recording is done yeah 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 no no we'll do we'll, Yeah. Yes, yeah. And uh, no, fantastic. I'll tell you what, I think we'll have a chat tomorrow or day after in terms of the whole thing again and the feedbacks and everything. Let, let's kind of uh, go and enjoy. I think it's, it's a long day. Yeah. Um, thank you once again. Yeah. Bye, bye Derek. Bye. <laughs> fantastic, Derek. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Kazım. Razal, without you, nothing, nothing would have happened. Um, congratulations for both of us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I copied. I copied all the chat box. Just because once uh, the Zoom thing is gone, we cannot uh, realize it. I copied everything in a Word document. Chat as well, is it? Okay, that's wonderful. Mm, then he calls to call me. He was uh, he was uh, he was very uh, congratulated. Then he said congratulations to both of us and thanked him. And I told him that I mean we are both committed individuals. We'll work on some common themes, and we both agreed that we'll do because uh, uh, all of us are uh, in many ways um, uh, different times are your pupils. You see, this this is your this is your network you have established. Oh yeah. Yeah. Razal, one of the things that I've learned, uh, which I'll share in more detail with you is, I think sometimes it is exactly what we are doing is the right course of action. Not only we are um, talking, we're executing uh, with some perfection, this kind of event. So I think people would want, you know, now a lot of curiosity will develop in many people. And also I think today bringing in people like Debbie Hare, Grace, here from UK and also Baliga. Mm. Yes, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Good talks, everyone. I mean, nobody disappointed us. Uh, starting from my brother Pratiksha. Uh, yeah. Even Pratiksha's talk is very relevant, and I think um, I thought I mean, it, it, uh, many people have. Even Tony. Yeah. Even Tony wrote. I think uh, he, he wrote to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, and I told him that. I told him exactly. And he wrote to me, very interesting day, Srikar. This is in the chat box. The lighting uh, works well uh, today um, uh, in my room, actually. He said, uh, um, excellent chairmanship and guidance over the flow of the day. Great presentation earlier from Dr. Patel. She is most engaging presenter, but most of all, congratulations to you for such a well-executed and structured couple of days. Thank you, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think uh, I'm, I'm pleased. Um, and also I think, um, um, yeah, anyway, Razal, it's four o'clock today for you early morning. Have, uh, we, we, we will go, we will, three o'clock, is it? Oh my goodness, brother, you're... <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. I'll join some of your talks in the future uh, for biotics. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. The, 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 I, I know, I've seen it. Sometimes, I mean, uh, you just signpost to me well in advance. I'll come and give a, you know, just join on your, your panel or something. Yeah. Okay, Razul. Mm 
we'll do that first first request to you is i want you to kind of sort out this uh, textbook thing um yeah mm. Mm. yeah that's okay i think he, he may not be work yeah mm. yeah uh, we will we'll catch up again you take some rest and um, yeah great day thank you very much for everything rosal thank you yeah say hello to jean as well my regards to her yeah thank you bye bye